This is the multiple choice from 1 to 10. The 2016 past paper, this is the multiple choice from 1 to 10. Remind you that in all of these papers I've taken out any questions that are no longer part of the national course. Okay. Diagram below shows part of a DNA molecule before and after mutation. Uh, the type of mutation shown is. Okay, so for a start, you should get rid of this straight away. Okay, the reason you should get rid of inversion is because this is a DNA molecule showing base pairs. So this is a this is a single gene mutation that we're looking for, a point mutation, something that's happening at just one place in a nucleotide. Okay, and then you could work out what it is. So just start reading it and find the difference. Here, it's like a spot the difference thing. There you go, there it is. Okay, that has been a substitution for a C for an E. Okay, it's not a deletion because we haven't removed anything. It's not an insertion, we haven't put anything in. Okay, that's it. Question two, which of the following are required in a PCR reaction? Okay, so PCR. PCR is your polymerase chain reaction, which is amplifying sections of DNA, which you are determining by bracketing the sequence with primers. Okay, so if this is your whole strength, kind of big long string, thousands upon thousands of base pairing going on across here, okay, and you decide which section of it you want, so see I've decided I want this section here, then you bracket that sequence with a primer on this side and a primer on this side to allow the DNA polymerase to function, okay, it has to be a heat tolerant DNA polymerase because we're going to use kind of brute force to separate these strands and by that I mean heating up, okay? So we need to have a template strand to start with, okay? That's the whole point of this thing here. We need the primers to bracket the sequence and we need DNA polymerase because we are doing DNA production. That's it, okay? Uh, Sorry, just checking which, yeah, okay. Uh, each cycle of a polymerase chain reaction takes five minutes there are 1,000 DNA fragments at the start of the reaction. How long will it take for the number of fragments produced by the reaction to be greater than 1 million? This is not exactly complicated maths, but you do have to be careful, okay? So here's our 1,000, okay? One run of PCR takes us up to 2,000, and then 4, and then 6, no, I can't count, 8, sorry, and then 16, and 32, I'm going to go all the way to here, just for the scribbling. Uh, 64, still in the thousands. Okay, 128,256. I'm going to go down here. <laughs> and that is 512000. And finally, finally we get over the million. Okay, so now you've got to do your count. Okay, so our count is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I did 10 repetitions of that. Each one takes 5 minutes, hence the reason it to see. Okay. I've, I know this isn't perfectly on, but I just wanted to try and get... Maybe if I move this slightly over. That, mm, okay, that'll just about do. Um, just wanted to get the whole thing on one page. Okay, the graphs below show possible changes in a body size of a po population of barn swallows in response to a selection pressure. So your solid line is the original population and then the dotted line is after selection. Which row in the table below matches each graph with the type of selection taking place? Okay, so graph one. Graph one, I started on the solid and I have moved my entire dotted line up. This is directional because I have shifted in the direction. Okay, graph two, um, what we've done is we've basically punched down the way, got rid of this initial one, and we've actually selected for the top and the bottom ends of this. This is disruptive. And in three, we've selected for the central point of this, and we have selected away from, you know, these sections on either side. So this is stabilizing. So let's just see where that is in terms of this. We were going graph one, we said was directional, two was disruptive, and three was stabilizing. There we go. 
Okay, diagram below represents a phylogenetic tree showing the evolution and relatedness of several species of cat. Okay, whole pile of them. With how many species does the African leopard, here we go, share a common ancestor in this phylogenetic tree? It's almost a trick question, okay, because if I follow back the African leopard, the whole point is that the African leopard goes back to a common ancestor for all of these ones in here. So... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, skip it, 10, 11, 12. It's, a, it's an odd question, but fair enough, it's the question. Okay, question 6. Over millions of years of evolution, mutations occur at a broadly constant rate within a gene. So this is a molecular clock. This allows genes to be used as molecular clocks. The diagram below shows how the base sequence in part of a gene changed as two evolutionary lineages diverged from an original base sequence. The base sequence in the gene has changed at a rate of one base per five million years. Assume this rate of mutation continues. By how many bases would this part of the gene differ if species X compared with species Y 20 million years after diverging from the original sequence. Okay, now this is a little bit sneaky. Okay, right. So if we start with our original sequence, which is what they showed here, okay, after 5 million years, okay, after 5 million years, there is a tweak, okay, so there is a, a change. So this is our split, okay, for species X. So species X gets a mutation one mutation. But species Y also gets a mutation. It's a different mutation. So species X to Y is actually two differences. Okay, because it's one different from the original, but it's also, Y has also changed from the original in a different way. Okay, so after 10 million years, X has changed by two from the original. After 15 million years, it's changed by three. And by 20 million years, it's changed by four. But Y has also changed by four. So if I could try to compare them, I would have to go kind of back the way and then out the way again on my kind of Y path. So in total, I have eight differences racked up. It's, you gotta be careful because a lot of people will go with the four, okay? Just from reading it very quickly. Okay, in metabolic pathways, the rates of reaction can be affected by the presence of enzyme inhibitors. Which row in the table below is correct? Okay, so we have two types of inhibitor, which you should know. Okay, we have competitive and we have non-competitive. This is all just straight definition stuff. So competitive binds at the active site, therefore making it difficult for the actual substrate to get into the active site. But that means that if I want to kind of outcompete the competitor, I can do that just by massively increasing substrate concentration. So if I increase my substrate concentration, then I can actually try and overcome the fact that I've got a competitor in there. Non-competitive, it's going to be a site somewhere else, you know, not the active site. And what that does is alters the shape of the enzyme, including the active site. So increasing substrate is not going to help that at all because it's not going to reverse it. So we're looking for something that fits to this. Okay, so competitive binds to active site. Yes, I'm okay with that. Effect of increasing substrate concentration reverses it. Actually, I'm all good with A, but check the rest. Non-competitive binds to the active site. No, okay, I don't agree with that because it doesn't. Competitive doesn't bind to active site. No, don't agree with that. Non-competitive binds to active site. No, I'm okay with that. And effects of substrate concentration reversed. No, because that doesn't do anything. Okay, so definitely A. Question eight. Which row in the table below identifies the number of heart chambers and the type of circulatory system in amphibians? I'm sorry, this is straight KU. Okay, so we have fish have got one ventricle, one atrium, and it's single. Okay, you then have amphibians and reptiles doing slightly different ways to get round the mixing of blood things, but they have um, two atrium, one ventricle, and this is an incomplete double. 
And then we have fish, fish, sorry, birds and mammals. So this is where we are. We've got two atrium, two ventricle, and that's a complete double. So we are looking for amphibians. So I am looking for two plus one, which I hope we call agree is three and I want an incomplete double. So A. Okay, question nine. I definitely didn't get the spacing right here, never mind. During unexpected period of drought, the South American lungfish, I'm not even gonna attempt to say its name, survives by burying in, into mud. This type of behavior is known as, okay, so it's straight KU stuff. Right, unexpected. Unexpected means that we are looking at something which is consequential. This is something that's happened because something happened, not that they were expecting it to happen because it said it was unexpected. So let's get rid of the predictive dormancy. Okay, Unexpected periods of drought is not going to be daily torpor, Okay, because that's, again, something that would be a kind of expected thing. And we're left with aestivation and hibernation. Now, aestivation is the way that they deal with drought, high temperatures, things like that. Hibernation is a predictive dormancy. It's a form of predictive dormancy with a long term um, lowering of metabolic rate. Um, so a different thing. OK, which you do need to know, but it's a different example. So aestivation. Question 10. Uh, an experiment was set up to investigate the effect of different respiratory substrates on the rate of respiration in yeast. Methylene blue can be used to measure the rate of respiration as it changes from dark blue to colourless when it accepts hydrogen ions. Okay, so basically, as any dehydrogenase activity goes on, they're going to be releasing hydrogen ions, which will be attached to the coenzyme NED, but if methylene blue is there, it will take some of them and it will change colour. Okay, so four test tubes were set up each containing yeast, methylene blue, and one of the respiratory substrates. Table below shows the results. We've got our four test tubes. We've got starch, sucrose, lactose, and glucose. And then we've got the appearance of methylene blue after 20 minutes. Okay, so it says it changes from dark blue to colourless when it accepts hydrogen. Okay, so starch, it was still dark blue. So that means you're not getting a lot of hydrogen being released. So this is, this is low respiration. Um, so is the lactose. And then the sucrose has gone light blue, so that's kind of, let's call that moderate respiration because it's gone light blue. But glucose has gone colourless, so that means that we've got we've got kind of fast respiration going on here. So if we've worked that out, then the conclusions are reasonably easy. Rate of respiration, is it higher with starch than with glucose? No. Okay, because we just said it's not. Okay, is it lower with sucrose than with lactose? Uh, sucrose was moderate and lactose was low, so no. Higher with glucose and lactose? Yes, because glucose won against everyone. And just to check, lower with glucose and sucrose? No. Okay, question 10, and that's that section. Okay. <laughs>